I thought about gins. Oh, yeah, I'm about to forget. Offering. Offering. Thank you. Go ahead and just go around and take that up. How many Christians did Jesus heal in the New Testament? We talked about this before, right? Let me ask you that again. How many Christians did Jesus Christ heal in the New Testament? Nada. None. What were they? They were all Jews or Gentiles, but mostly Jews. Jesus was sent to the Jews. How many Christians ate bread multiplied at the hand of Christ? None. How many, how many Christians ate fish multiplied by the hand of Christ? None. How many Christians drank wine multiplied by the hand of Christ? None. And we get in our mind that sinners cannot be healed. Think about that. We get inside our Christian mindset in this day that if somebody's lost and they're living in sin, that Christ cannot and will not heal them. But I want to stand before you today as your pastor and defunct that and tell you, put that far from your mind. Healing is children's bread. It is designed to feed the children. But it is also a sign and a wonder. And signs are something you post on the side of the road so those who are lost can find their way. And so we got this revival coming up the 10th, 11th, and 12th. And now we keep saying, tell the unchurched, tell the unchurched. Listen, there's a world of people out there that are sick, they're hurting, they're dying. Their bodies are racked with disease. They have no hope in this world. Absolutely no place else to turn. All the doctors are telling them negative, negative, negative. They have no else place to look besides man. And because of that, they're lost. They're hopeless and they're in despair. And you tell them, we're having a revival at our church Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. We're not having it three nights because we think they have to come all three nights. We're having it three nights because some people can't be here on Friday night, but they could be here on Saturday night. And some people that can't be here on Friday night, Saturday night, maybe they can be here on Sunday night. We're doing it for three nights to open up the availability to as many people as you can possibly gather up and get them in here. And if the, I don't care how lost they are, I don't care what their lifestyle is, I don't care what else is going on in their life, you tell them, Jesus Christ the righteous is still the healer. He is still the one who came off the cross, wore stripes upon his back to heal the lost and the sick and the hurting. And you know a church that loves them enough that even in their current condition, I, if they walk up in here and they don't believe everything we believe, they don't believe how we believe, and they don't believe what we believe, I still believe that Jesus Christ will introduce himself to them as the healer of the world in that moment so that when they walk out the door, they'll say, who was that? What was that? That's the hook in their jaw to draw them in. So you tell them, you know who they are. You know where they are. They're, they're at work. They're at school. They're living across the street from you. They're living lifestyles and in ways that you know aren't exactly right, and so do they. Don't go over there and address their sin. Go over there and invite them for healing. You go over there and tell them, we're having a thing in our church for you. And we want you to come. And those three nights, we're not going to preach. We're going to sing two songs each night unless the Lord moves in a different way. We're going to sing two songs, just kind of set the atmosphere. We're going to preach a short, power-packed, faith-building message on healing, 15 to 20 minutes. Within 30 minutes of the start of the service, I hope to be laying hands on the sick. That's going to be the whole point of those three nights, to get them in the altar and lay hands on the sick. How can a man who is dying and gets healed walk out and not believe in the healer? When the blind in the New Testament were healed, guess what? They believed on him who had healed them over and over and over. So you go get them and bring them in. Go get them. You tell them. And, and you know, it's in the back of your head, you might be saying, well, what happens if they don't get healed? You know, that, that's up to the master. That's between father and them. Not between me, father, and them. I'm going to have faith to believe that every one of them we lay our hands on will be healed instantaneously. That God will pour his compassion and his love into them and they will be healed. So go out there and invite them. I really want that to be a big night. Uh, this. Anybody still didn't get one of these that needs it? Got four more back there that need that. All right, and that's the chart from last uh, two weeks ago where we were talking about 
these seven Asian assemblies. And I think we finally got through all seven. And I had you looking at this chart. Uh, just very quickly over the chart again. If you look across the top, it's kind of laid out where it says scripture. Remember, I put the scripture that that chart relates to right there. What you see underneath it is the description of Jesus in that scripture. Over and over and over there in those first seven churches, you will see Jesus describing himself. That was, that was everything I had. Can you share one maybe across the aisle or something there? I don't know. Make about five more. And then uh, you'll see the name of the church, what was good going on in the church, what was bad that was going on in that church. You'll see the cost of what it was costing them for the bad that was going on in that church. Then you'll see the solution. He didn't just go up and tell them what was wrong with them. He told them a solution for what was wrong. And then after that, you'll see the reward. So that's all on that chart. I think we went through that, the whole thing. And, uh, but I wanted to make sure that everybody had a copy of that. There's some good study there if you want to go through and look all that up yourself. Especially look at those rewards. Look at the solutions and the rewards. Remember when we're going through this prophetic stuff, especially with these seven Asian assemblies, there's three perspectives you need to look at. There's a personal perspective in each one of those churches. For example, in number one, I need to make sure I haven't left my first love. That's number one. And so that would be in the personal side of it. Number two, there's a perspective for the church body as a whole. The church as a pastor, I need to make sure as a church, we're not losing our first love. And then there's also a historical perspective. A prophetic historical perspective. That's the part I'm going to show you tonight is the prophetic historical perspective. So if you'll look on those charts, if you'll look at the last page, page number three, that's where we're going to um, start out at tonight. Now, and I know you've got it in your hand, but I'm going to uh, just draw it up here just a little. I'm not going to fill it all in. Numbers right. 1517 from 1517 to 1750. 1750 to 1917. And 1917 to present. I, I just want to put that part on there. Now, as you look at the seven Asian assemblies, what you will find is as you are looking at them in a prophetic timeline, you can actually see the prophetic timeline going uh, from all the way from Christ, the death of Christ. All the way up through. If you'll look at that chart, you'll see that the church at Ephesus represents the desirable one. When the first, when the church first got saved, first got started, the 120 in the upper room, they come out of the upper room, and what happens to them? They receive the Holy Ghost, but what happens when they leave the upper room? What's going on in Rome? Persecution. What begins to happen to them? What happened? They get dispersed. They get dispersed. What was the persecution? Come on, guys. Y'all know a little about the history. What, what happened to them? They get, they're getting beheaded. Thrown in jail. They're getting thrown to the gladiators. Uh, they're being thrown to lions. And, what, and so what happens is you'll find right here great persecution begins to take place. From 33 all the way up to about 312, horrible persecution is taking place. They start out as the desirable one. The church is growing. And even though the persecution is happening, what's happening to the church? It's growing like crazy. It's, and the reason it's growing is because they're being spread out all over the place. They can't just stay 120 of them right there in Rome, right there in Jerusalem, right there in that little hub. They can't stay right there. They're being driven all over the face of the earth. Remember, Rome owned all the known world at that time. 
So anywhere they went, they were under Roman control and they were being driven farther and farther and farther away from Jerusalem. And they carried the gospel of Christ everywhere. They started out as the desirable one. They became the persecuted church. And then after that, we talked about this last week or two weeks ago with Pergamus. All of a sudden, they began to be married to the world at about 312 to 590. That's when they, the, the, the uh, Catholic church and the world married together. That's when you begin to see a lot of these heresies begin to come into the church. That started between 312 and 590. Uh, married to the world, they became a continual sacrifice, always in sin, always in sin. Then at the, after that, in uh, 1570 to 1750, about here, what you find is there was only a small remnant of saints left. Because perversion had so entered into the church that there was only a small number of people left. There were only very few people who still knew who Christ was. We actually have a name for this in history. What do y'all call this, history buffs? Does anybody know what that age is called? The Dark Ages. Because during the Dark Ages, if you remember, the Bible had not been translated into a readable language. Only the priesthood spoke Latin. All the Bibles were still in Latin. And the only thing you had as far as information about who Christ was is what was given to you by the priesthood. That was it. What they read out of the scripture. That was all you got. The, their translation. Then the printing press came about. That remnant began to grow. And once again, at the Church of Philadelphia, you find that in about... 1750 to 1917, the church again became the desirable one. What happened in that time period from 1750 to 1917? Early on in the 1750s, anybody know? The printing press and something else happened right here. King James. The Reformation. The Reformation. And King James, the, the Bible, and the printing press, all that. The King James was quite a bit earlier than that, but the printing press to print it. And the Reformation broke out. And so right here, the church again became the desirable one. And then Laodicea, where we are today, apostasy and a self-satisfied church. If you'll look at that, if you'll follow this chart right here across the top, you'll actually be able to see how that from here to here, each of those churches is a gauntlet or a timeline of how we started from the death of Christ to where we are right now. You can see the condition of the church changing. It was a desirable bride and then all of a sudden it became so persecuted it was scattered but then that bride became adulterous and married the world and because of that there was a continual necessity for sacrifice of sin until there was only a remnant left. But then the word came and they once again became washed and desirable but once they became washed and desirable again, very quickly they fell right back into self-satisfied apostasy and spiritual adultery. It's a timeline. That's the prophetic timeline in the first seven. Any questions about that? I'm trying not to move too fast, but I think I am. Okay. Now, here's what is something I want to show you. Turn over back to Mark chapter 4. Something the Lord showed me in this. There is a great warning for the church here. Now, before here, the reason I didn't put anything out here, there was no church there. There is no church before 33 AD. Why is there no church before 33 AD? Because Christ hasn't died. There are no Christians. The church was birthed after the death of Christ. We became the church. Okay? Now, so up to this point, there is no church. Go back over there to Mark chapter 4. We're looking at the parable of the sower. And I want to just read the explanation for part starting at verse 14. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who when they hear the word immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves and so endure for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now, these are the ones among thorns that are the ones who hear the word and the cares of the world. The deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things enter in, choking the word, and it becomes unfruitful. 
But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, bear the fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. I have preached this gauntlet I don't know how many times. I can grab that and start preaching right this minute and preach for an hour. Just right there out of Mark chapter 4 on the gauntlet. But what I want to show you tonight is this timeline of the church is absolutely follows this gauntlet. And at the end of that gauntlet, there is a stern, very serious warning for the church of the United States of America and worldwide. And specifically for the church here in America, there's a very serious warning at the end of this. And this warning is the reason I want to bring this out. If you will look at this same thing. This was a desirable church, and I know it's on your, on your uh, paper. The first level of the gauntlet is this. The enemy comes and steals the word as soon as it hits the ground. Right? So there's no, there's no growth there. There's no salvation. You heard the word, the enemy snatched the word, and you never got saved. Now, for those of you who've never heard my teaching on the gauntlet, um, just very quickly, I teach Mark chapter 4 are not different stations in life that you go to and you stay there. It is a progressive gauntlet that we walk in war in spiritual warfare. Okay? Now, the second thing that happens right here, in those, if you'll combine those two, that is the persecution and affliction for the word's sake. What happened here is, at the second level, this church became persecuted and afflicted. What does it say is the second level there in the gauntlet? I read it. It says that number one, the enemy comes, steals the word of God or the seed. So immediately it does not root. That's right here. That was before the church was ever born. But then when the corn hits the ground fresh and new and the ground is, it is rocky soil, immediately it springs up. And immediately as it springs up, Something happens. Persecution and affliction arises for why? For the word's sake. And if you'll look on my chart, these first two levels are a persecuted and afflicted church. The church was being physically persecuted in the first level. And in the second level, it, became, it, was, it, it was desirable that persecution started. And here the persecution really, really wrapped up and they were scattered all over the earth. This was persecution and affliction for the word's sake. To try to drive the word out. Just like here the enemy's goal was to cause the root of that seed to dry up and die. What was the pur pur purpose of the affliction of the church? To cause the word to dry up and die. That the name of Jesus would leave everybody's lips. If I could pour out enough fire and brimstone. And put them in enough pain. If I could kill enough of them. They'll just all shut up and go home and let his name die. That was happening in those two time frames. That is the church at Ephesus and Smyrna. But then we're going to combine the next three. In this next three, these are the cares of the world. The deceitfulness of riches. And the lust of other things. Now look on your chart right there at what was happening to the churches. In Pergamos, the church became married to the world. And because they were so married to the world, there began this continual sacrifice. But the sacrifice became tainted. You begin to see the world coming in, idolatry entering into the church. This is where you begin to see the indulgences in the church. Where you begin to see the teaching on um, purgatory and all that entering into the church. All of that happening right here because they became married to an adulterated system inside the world. Until there was nothing left but a remnant. What happens right here? After persecution, remember in my teaching what I've told you. What's going to happen is you're going to hear a word from God. And the enemy is going to come and steal it a number of times. But there's going to be a day it's going to come. You're going to hear a word from God. And you're not going to allow the enemy to steal it. And it's going to start taking root. And when it does, the enemy is going to pour out persecution and affliction for the word's sake. To try to get you to reach out and say it doesn't work. It's not worth the fight. And grab a hold of it and pull it up and throw it away. He's trying to get you to do that. And then when he decides that he cannot get you to pull it up and throw it away because you're withstanding the persecution and affliction, what he will do then is he will change his tactics. 
He will come in and bring cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things, and get you so distracted and so married to the world that you will no longer pay heed to what you know. You will become so worldly that there's no good left in you. Look what's happening to the church right here. Look on your chart. The Starting at the uh, third level. Married to the world with a continual sacrifice until there's only a remnant left. So you're beginning to see a timeline. That's, and, we're, and we're building up to where we are right now. This starting from the death of Christ. When the church was persecuted and afflicted. Then the world began to try to move in. Here comes the warning for us today. Then all of a sudden the next level is the 30, 60, 100 fold. And this is where we really need to look at very closely for ourselves. In the 30, 60, 100 fold. Notice it says you are a desirable one. That goes all the way back to here. What happened? There was a reformation. Martin Luther nailed 95 Thesis on the door of the church. And it turned the church world upside down. Had Martin Luther not nailed that 95 Thesis on that door. There would have been no rebirth of the Holy Ghost. That happened in the early 1900s here in the United States of America. That set a revival fire across the whole world. It brought the truth of the word of God back to the masses. It stopped salvation by works. Brought back salvation by grace. It moved faith to the forefront. Put works back in its proper place. And right there, they became desirable again. But I want you to notice what happened in one generation. They went from desirable to self-satisfied. In one step. And this right here is where he said, you're lukewarm. I will spew you out of my mouth. I would that you were hot or cold, but you are lukewarm. You are blind, naked, miserable, and wretched. But you say you are what? I am what? Rich and in need of nothing. Now look right here. Look at what's happened. The person, the, at first, the enemy so persecuted the church that the church could not bear up under the affliction, but they wouldn't quit. They kept growing. Now remember, I've told you this before. Persecution and affliction does two things. It reduces quantity, but it increases quality. Persecution and affliction reduces quantity, increases quality. What was happening right here, they were killing them by the thousands. They were trying to reduce quantity. But as they reduced the quantity, the quality increased. The power of the Holy Ghost increased. The moving of the Spirit increased. Increase, increase, increase. So what's the enemy do? Brings the cares of the world, the secretness of riches, and lust of other things. The church went into an easy state. And then look what happened. Because he couldn't completely destroy it. Those that he couldn't destroy. Here was a remnant. And what he does is he brought that remnant. And they become the desirable one. And in an effort to destroy them. Now we have the 30, 60, 100 fold. Now watch. We've always thought that the 30, 60, 100 fold is a spiritual nirvana. Think about what you've known in the past about the, the parable of the sower. Everybody in this room, you've all said, ooh, I don't want to be shallow soil. I don't want to be rocky soil. I don't want to be thorny soil. I don't want to be over there where the, the crows are coming to eat the corn. I don't want to be where the sun bakes it until it dies. And I don't want to be over there where the thorns choke it out. I all, everybody in this room's always wanted to be what? 30, 60, 100 fold fruit. And we've all thought to ourselves, if I can get there, if I can get to the 30, 60, 100 fold place, then I can switch into neutral, stop fighting so hard, be in spiritual nirvana, sit in my spiritual recliner, raise up my spiritual feet, and just rest for a while. Is that not what's in our mind when we think about 30, 60, 100 fold? If I'm producing 30, 60, and 100 fold, I got plenty to eat, plenty to drink, plenty of rest. I don't have to labor. Everything I touch turns to gold. That's spiritual nirvana. Well, I got news for you. We don't believe in nirvana. That's Hinduism. We don't believe in that. We believe that Paul said, war and good warfare. Push through to the end. Run your race all the way to the end. 
There's never a place in Christian teaching where the Bible says to us, come to a plateau, switch into neutral, get in your easy chair, put on your slippers and rest for a while. It's not there. And what the enemy has convinced us as a church is that if we get to 30, 60, 100 fold, then we will be people that have arrived. And what we see, open your eyes right now for a minute and think about what's going on around us. Right this minute in the United States of America, the church is more prospered than it has ever been. It has more money. It has more slush. It has more fluff. It has more airplanes, bigger buildings, more television, more radio. It has more money and stuff than it's ever had in the history since 33 AD. The Christian church. Am I right? Then are we not living in 30, 60, 100 fold abundance? Now here's the warning. Here's the very grave warning. Go back and look at Laodicea. Look on your chart, look Laodicea. <clears throat> you are self deceived. You are poor, blind, naked, and wretched. But what did they say about themselves? What was their self-proclamation? I am rich and in what? I am rich and in need of nothing. And here is a very stern warning in the teaching of the seven Asian assemblies for the church today where we are right this minute. If we are not really, really careful, we will become Laodicea. And because we have things and because we have ease and because even because we are seeing the glory of God and a move of the spirit, if we're not real careful, we will come to the place that we will say, I am rich and have need of nothing. And the, and the Lord says to us, you can go to that 30, 60, 100 fold place. But when you get there, you better make sure you are hot or cold. You better not switch into neutral. You better not get lukewarm. You better never get satisfied with your airplanes and your big houses and your fancy cars and your time on the television. You better not ever get satisfied. You better stay hungry for my face and stop worrying about my hand. Because what happens is, listen, when the church of Laodicea said, I am rich and in need of nothing. Here's what they said. I eat freely from the hand of my father. That's what they said. I am rich and in need of nothing. I have been enriched by God. I have need of nothing in this world. I have everything I need. I am well dressed. I am well kept. I am well fed. I am on my way. I am in a land of spiritual ease. And God looked at him and said, you're blind, naked, miserable, and wretched. What's he talking about? He, who's he talking to? He is talking to people in 30, 60, 100 fold abundance. It is a grave warning. Here's a problem. It, because what happens is we have a hunger for the hand of God, but no appetite for the face of God. In Laodicea, what happened was... They had a hunger for the hand of God, but they lost their appetite for the face of God. And there is the grave warning for the church of the United States of America, for the church of Bell's Chapel Assembly of God. If we're not real careful, we'll get so used to coming in and we play the music and we sing the songs and the spirit falls and people are touched and the Holy Ghost falls and we see this and we see that and miracles and signs and wonders and we will become complacent and we will think we have arrived and we'll be thinking that we're in the 30, 60, 100 fold and we are and the whole time God is saying, then yes, you're in the 30, 60, 100 fold, but stop looking for my hand. Stop changing facing my hand. Stop begging me for manna. I'll give you manna. Look for my face. Look for my face. I'm asking you, stop having a hunger for my hand, but have an appetite for my face. Amen. What's the difference between a hunger and an appetite? <coughs> an appetite drives you. Think about it. You can wake up and want a, a cup of coffee, have an appetite for a cup of coffee and not even be thirsty. That's for all the coffee drinkers. For all you chocolate eaters, I'll say this. You can absolutely be full as you can be. And you can still want a piece of chocolate. You can want that piece of chocolate so bad that you'll get in your car and drive across town and buy a candy bar. So you can have that piece of chocolate. And it makes no sense. There's no reason for you to want it. You're not even really hungry. But you got a what? An appetite for that chocolate. 
And it doesn't matter if you had a piece of chocolate right after lunch, you still want a piece of chocolate. Why? Because you've got an appetite for that chocolate. Appetite drives us. Appetite pushes us forward. And appetite will keep us in motion regardless of our hunger. I can, be, I can be physically full and have no place to put anything else. And if I have an appetite for a piece of chocolate pie, I will open my mouth and put that pie in my mouth even though my belly says, what are you doing? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the Christian church has become so full in their belly. You can do this. You can ruin your appetite. How do you do that? You become so satiated with the stuff of your belly that you no longer have an appetite for where it came from. I love fried bologna sandwiches, but if I eat them for 22 meals in a row, what's going to happen to my appetite? I'm not going to have an appetite for them anymore. I might still like them, but I'm not going to want one for a few days. And if we're not real careful, that's what happens to us. We become so satiated. We eat of the things of God and we eat of the things of God and we eat of the things of God and we eat of the things of God. And we're consuming it upon our own lust and we're consuming it upon our own flesh. And we become Laodicea. We're living in the land of 30, 60, 100. Listen to me, church. God called us to be 30, 60, 100 fold. We are in the timeline. Listen to me. This lines up with where we are on the timeline of God. We're called to be 30, 60, 100 fold. We're called to prosper. We're called to be spiritually alive. We're called to not be in hunger. We're called to be to have the gold tried in the fire. The eye sack to put on our eyes. And a white robe of righteousness to put on our back. We're called to be those things. But God called us in that in hot and in cold. Do not sit back and go into neutral. Don't you get lazy where you are. Don't you get satisfied where you're sitting. Don't you stop praying. Don't you stop reading your Bible. I don't care if you raise 500 people from the dead. You get up and put your wife I robe of righteousness on and you rub your eyes sap on your eyes and you rattle the gold that you got freely in your pocket and you get up and you go to work don't you dare get cold or excuse me lukewarm be cold or hot yes. one or the other yes. we're called this is where he called us to be but here is a warning from Laodicea have an appetite for his face always Yes. Yes. Do you realize if you find his face, you'll always find his hand? Amen. Listen to this. In the first three levels, from here, let me get a different color marker. In the first three levels, from here to right here, this is spiritual poverty. That's spiritual poverty. Right here is spiritual overflow. Where are we in the timeline today? Spiritual overflow. What is supposed to be happening in the church today? Spiritual overflow. Listen, here's the difference. In spiritual poverty, I am chasing the hand of God. If I'm living in spiritual overflow, the hand of God is chasing me. Think about it. If I am living in spiritual poverty, I am continually chasing the hand of God. Chasing the hand of God. Chasing the hand of God. But when I move into the place of spiritual overflow... Because I know his face, because I am in his face, because I have an appetite for his face, his hand overtakes me. And it's the difference between a hunger and an appetite. And so right here, we have, this is um, God pursuing us. Over here, it's us pursuing the hand of God. And so there is the, the greatest, you know, when you read that, I think everybody is spiritually attuned enough to know that when we read the story of, of Laodicea, that there's a warning there. And the warning is this. You are called to be in spiritual overflow. That's the day we're living in. We are called as a Christian church. If we are not living in 30, 60, 100 fold, we're living far below where we're supposed to be. We're called to that. But we've got to get there by hungering, having an appetite for his face. And I guess maybe I should say this. 
to, because when I say hungry for his face, people say, what does that mean? Relationship. I'm going to give you a two-fold test to ask yourself, am I chasing his hand or am I having an appetite for his face? Here's a two-fold test. Okay? <coughs> Number one. <coughs> Number two. These two answer, the answer to these two questions will give it there. What does my prayer life look like? Number one. Number two, I'm going to actually give you three. What does my study life look like? <coughs> Number three, this is just a um, carrot on a stick for what's coming for some teaching in the near future. How long has it been since you fasted? Threefold test to ask yourself: Have I switched into neutral? Am I in that lukewarm state? Have I been hot or cold in the past, but I've switched into lukewarm? There's you a threefold test. What does my prayer life look like? What does my study time look like? And how long has it been since I fasted? And the answers to those three questions will be self-evident to you on whether or not you've switched into neutral. Are you here with Laodicea, or are you here? If you score good two out of three, uh, you're getting there. Yes. Yes, I believe that we will never know our true cause or our identity in Christ unless we spend time in intimacy with the Father. I believe that 100. percent You cannot know who you are in Him until you know Him. You cannot. Any other comments or questions about that? That was just all some stuff the Lord showed me the other day when I was studying this out. That was finished out that chart. Yes, Ashley. You said that you can be in different, you can run more than one gauntlet. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Can you, can you, be be in a, you can be in a different place in the gauntlet in your life at different places at, different, at, at the same time. Yeah, yes. Okay. Does that include the spiritual poverty and spiritual health? Yes, I do believe it can. It is possible for you to be spiritually impoverished in one area of your life. Let's say maybe in your health. You're still working on that part of it, but as far as your tithing and your financial, you know, your finances are great. You're in spiritual relationship with God. You're tithing. You're doing everything you're supposed to with all that. That's all wonderful. You're in spiritual overflow on that part, but maybe you're struggling with your health. Okay. So, yes, you can be in different places on that gauntlet at different times in your life, you know, or at the same time in your life, excuse me. Any other comments or questions on all that? Because I'm fixing to switch gears. If you think about it, going back to her question here, uh, if you go back to Mark, it shows you how to get the balance for that. If you think of it like this, if you are deficient in one area of your life, if you sow a seed toward that area, then that area will start to grow. Mm -hmm. can, you can make everything marry up to the same level if you put the same time and investment, like she said. Yeah. Each one of those areas. Of course, it's easy for us to sow a seed or to pay our tithe. And, of course, the Lord has no choice. His power is going to work on your behalf and your finances because you sow a seed for that. But a lot of times we fail to realize, okay, well, what about peace of mind? We Absolutely. We never think about sowing a seed to what those little so, small mind You pay. bet. And that's where Satan gets us. Of course, he'll let you have the money. But if he can give you cancer... Yeah. And he can destroy you. Or, or, make, or make you crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Take the peace out of your life. So if you sow a seed towards each one of those areas, you can you can make a healthy balance all the way straight down the line. And it is you possible. Can 30, 60, 90, 40, all the way down. Yeah, and I know the enemy's going to convince you it's not, but it is possible for you to have a place in your life at 30, 60, 100 fold, and it maintain 30, 60, 100 fold while you're bringing other places up to it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, sometimes we get the idea, well, I got 
point number one in my life there. Well, I was trying to get number two there. This one came back and then, you know, you, you, like you're always in a tussle. But it is absolutely possible, the will of God and the desire of God, for you to get all the areas of your life here for 30, 60, 100 fold. But when you get it there, here's the warning. Do not go to neutral. If you move into spiritual neutral, you will be Laodicea, self-satisfied, self-serving, self-identifying as rich, while Christ is screaming, wake up! What's the sign of going into spiritual neutral? People whose prayer life looks like nothing. You know, when I get to spiritual, when I get to 30, 60, 100 fold, what I'll find is, let's say, well, Lord, I used to have to pray over my kids, but they're all doing great. I used to have to pray over my car, but it's running fine. I used to have to pray over my job, but everything's going well there. Well, Lord, I don't even have anything. I don't need to pray today. Everything's perfect. And so my prayer life goes to nil because I no longer feel an urgency to prayer. There's nothing driving me there. Um, I feel like I don't need to read my Bible as much anymore uh, because I, you know, Everything's perfect. I, you know, I don't feel like I'm in need. I'm not in lack. I, I stopped digging for the face of the Father. I feel like I have arrived. I found him. I'm there. And I surely am not fasting because the reason you fast is mourning. I'm mourning for something that I need in my life. And so that, that mourning drives me to a fast. And so I'm, not, I'm definitely not in mourning, so I completely quit fasting. That is a very strong test. On whether I am in a self-satisfied state or as Laodicea or have I answered the door of the scripture for Laodicea says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, he's talking to the church. I'm knocking on the door. Will you open? If you will, we'll come in and sup with you. Yeah. That's relationship. Lisa. Let us do that with a right heart and not as a religious, like a Today, yep. Right. Let's do that with the right heart. Let's constantly fellowship with God all day long. Let us long to be in the Word of God. Let us long mm -hmm. to be in His presence. Yep. You know, if Terry wakes up this tomorrow morning and says, "Oh, Lisa's in there making coffee. I got to go in there and make nice." This so way, Wade's in the coffee in, the, in there in the kitchen. Says, "Hey, Lisa, how are you this morning?" Oh, I hope you have a great day at work. And then he goes on his way. And so then at lunch, he says, oh, I've got to text her again. How are you? Hope you're having a great day. Send. Uh, you know, and then when he gets home, he's coming in like, oh, I've got to go in there and talk to her again. <laughs> Is that really going to do y'all any good? What's your relationship going to look like after about two weeks of that? Yeah, he's going to be sleeping in the back seat of the car. That's exactly right. Because what's going to happen is, even though you don't know he has that attitude, the first week is killing his heart towards you. And when we go to the Father that way, oh, I've got to read this Bible again today. And, oh, well, I've got to go over here and talk to him for a while or he's going to be mad. Even though it's not killing his heart towards me. What's it doing to my heart towards him? It's killing it. And I'm moving into that lukewarm stage. Instead of Terry wakes up every single morning and thinks, oh, my bride's in there making coffee. She's got coffee hot. I can't wait to go in there and see her and give you a big hug and a kiss. Say, man, darling, I hope you have a great day. And at noon, I can't wait to get to my phone in my locker so I can send her a text and make sure everything's going great. And she, he sends a happy text because he really loves and is concerned. And he runs in the door in the afternoon just waiting to make sure you had a wonderful day. What's that going to do for your relationship? It's going to grow. Your relationship's going to grow. And we can't ask Father to do nothing. And you can. Yes, absolutely. So that's the way we need to approach it. If we go into it with a bad attitude, we're not going to grow. It goes back to this question. What is your appetite? What is your appetite for the world or for Christ? And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to make a ventured guess. If you are feeding your flesh the things of this world proportionally greater than you are feeding your spirit the things of the Lord, the things of the kingdom of life, I'm going to make a guess 
that what you will say to me is your appetite for the things of light is diminished. And it feels like you have to make yourself do that stuff. And your appetite for the things of the world is greater. You know, when I was working at Cheeks Wholesale as a kid, I started working there when I was about 15, 16. And I would go in there and those old guys were all drinking coffee. Hated it. It was this bitter, black, stinking stuff that made people's breath smell terrible. I did not want no part of coffee. I wouldn't drink it, but they were all, they carried it around all the time, acting like it was wonderful. Well, that first winter hit and it was cold and they would go to the break room and stay for a few minutes and get coffee where it was warm. And I figured out real quick, that if you can't drink it, at least carry it around in the cup, go, you know, cause it was a way to get a little break, you know? And so I carried it around and I got to sipping on it and it wasn't long. And you know what? Today I absolutely have an appetite for coffee. I love coffee. Yeah. I wake up. Think, woo, coffee time. I gotta go get me a cup of coffee. Because I have an appetite for it. But did you know I didn't, didn't start out that way? Had no appetite for it. Had no hunger for it, no appetite for it. But I developed an appetite for it because I gave it my time and my attention. And what you give your time and attention is where you're gonna have appetites. And so the more I give my time and attention to something, I'm gonna have an appetite for it. If I'm giving my time and attention to the world, I'm gonna have an appetite for the world. If I give my time and attention to the Father, I'll have an appetite for the Father. I can develop my appetites. I can kill my other appetites by ignoring them, pushing them aside, and not having anything to do with them. Listen, to be hungry is to want his bread. To have an appetite is to want his face. Hunger is of the belly. Appetite. Can I give that nugget away? Thank you. This is, this is some teaching that's not came yet. I'll just write right over the top of this. Hunger is of the belly. By the way, your belly makes a mighty fine servant. It makes a terrible master. <coughs> your belly makes a mighty fine servant, but a terrible master. Your appetite is of your mind, which is your soul. Remember, the soul is the mental, mental aspect, the emotions, the thoughts, the intents of the heart. That's your soul. Your hunger is of your belly. Your appetite is of your mind, your soul. But, you know, but we are a tripatriot being. What's tripatriot mean? That means we are a body, soul, and a what? A spirit. So if the hunger is of the belly and the appetite is of the mind, there has to be an aspect that is of the spirit. And I want to show you what my study has led me to, something I'm going to bring up to y'all a whole lot more of in the very near future. And the question, we've got to be able to fill in that blank because if my hunger and my appetite is going to be in the right place, there has to be something that keeps it there. My, my, my body and my soul only stay in the right place where my spirit is strong. So what keeps my hunger and my appetites in the, in the right place? And get ready for this. Fast. See, if you've got a problem with your hunger and your appetite, you got to, it's time to fast. If your flesh is out of control and your mind is out of control and you need your spirit to rise to ascendancy, there's an easy answer, fast. If your hunger is not where, if your hunger is out of control, we're talking to the spiritual aspect, but it can go physically also. If your hunger is absolutely out of control, your body, you give your body any and everything it asks for, whether it's good for it or not. That can go everywhere, anything and everything from horror movies to pornography to alcohol, drugs, etc. Your flesh is out of control. Then if your flesh is out of control, there's a good chance that you're struggling in your appetites. And you need to bring these two things under control just exactly like if your body and your soul are out of control. You've got to bring your spirit into bear over them. And the way you do that is right here, fast. But there's a right way to do it. I'm going to be teaching in the very near future the right way to do it. A strong way to do it. What it's good for, how it does. I'll throw you another bone out there because I don't have enough time. I, I, I have... Made myself a vow I will not be drunk on the sound of my own voice tonight, so I'm almost done. <laughs> I will not talk longer than your seat can endure. So, just for your own study, go look at Mark or Matthew chapter 5. 
the Beatitudes. I want to tell you, if you'll go look really, really close at the Beatitudes in Mark chapter 5, you'll find this. That the belly is a great servant, but a terrible master. It's in Mark chapter 5. I mean, I mean Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. That thing. If you'll go look really, really close, you'll find this right there in the Beatitudes. Any other comments or questions on that? Am I reading that clock right back there that says it is 735? You are. Vicki. <laughs> yes. That is a fast. There is no way around it. He was fasting something. I'll guarantee you. When he was buffeting his body. All right. Next week, I am going to start actually the the tribulation part. We're going to start. We're going to talk about the seventy weeks of Daniel. Then we're going to move right into the seven seals, the seven trumpets, uh, the seven golden vials. We're going to get into the heavy duty. Uh, part of Revelations that just makes people's minds go crazy because they don't know what all that's talking about. So we're going to get into that starting next week right here uh, at 6.30 Revelations about chapter 5, 6 is where we'll be at next week. So any other comments or questions? Father, I thank you for your power and your grace. <laughs> Father, I thank you that you love us so much that you have brought us to 30, 60, 100 fold abundance. Father, I know you have thought good thoughts of us. Yes, thoughts of abundance, thoughts of good and not of evil to bring us to an expected end, 30, 60, 100 fold. Father, I know that that is your desire for each and every one of us individually. And I see here, Father, in your word that it is your calling for the church to be at a 30, 60, 100 fold dispensation today. Father, we are a people who see and hear. And so today, Father, we declare and decree as you lead, as you guide, as you multiply our hands, we will walk in 30, 60, 100 fold. But Father, we will do it humbly before you in a robe of righteousness. We won't wear eyes salve that we will see your face clearly. Father, we will buy the gold tried in fire that you give freely to us. Father, we will make sure our righteous robes stay spotless and we will follow you and not become self-satisfied. Father, truly, we know this, though we may have much stuff Yet we need your face beyond all measure for without it we are wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. So Father we cry out, by your face we will live. By your grace we will walk. By your power we will endure till the end. Lead us, guide us, direct us, and show us your face above all else. And Father as we leave this place tonight, cause your anointing to be upon us. Each and every one of us salt and light. And I thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight.